Hey guys, welcome. Uh, very happy and delighted to have uh, John Lee of at CEO and founder, let me rather say CEO and founder uh, of Silver Elephant Mining with quite a few uh, holdings across uh, interesting places as well. In fact, we're speaking to him currently in uh, Mongolia uh, from our cuddly little spot in Panama. John, glad to have you on the show. Welcome. Yeah, thank you, Francis, for the invite. It's great to be on your show for the first time. And uh, t give us a little bit of your background for people that don't know you, because you have essentially walked the deserts, if I can give you a little bit of a big up and tee you up a little bit. You've walked the deserts of a very frustrating precious metals market for quite a while, but you are actually a founder of a small cap for now, I argue, a uh, silver miner with a variety of holdings, if you care to detail those. Give us the story since how you started it, why you got into it, and your journey so far. Yeah, for instance, uh, I was uh, I was born in Taiwan and uh, been in the mining industry, the metals investment business for, for 20 years. The first 10 years, uh, it was uh, 2000 to 2010 as an investor after I semi-retired from the Silicon Valley. And I was doing quite well in investing in metals and mining and, uh, you know, caught the bottom of the gold market, $250 when Gordon, Gordon Brown dubbed that last batch of gold. Brown's well, bottom. Kind of the silver market when the silver is $3.50 back in 2004. And then uh, the financial crisis came in 2010. I started uh, a, a junior mining company as, as a hobby and uh, think of just a hobby and, and, and 13 years later, turning into a 13 year uh, third, double, double full time job, raised over $150 million through the Toronto Ventures Exchange. I'm an avid traveler and uh, economist, a chartered financial analyst, travel over 40 countries, lived in three different continents. So always been very fascinated. Uh, my passion is always to speak arbitrage in the market like you are, but now I've added this dimension from, from, from the mining side as well. Right. Only someone with the work ethic of a Taiwanese would take up uh, a, a hobby of starting a mining company, I have to say. Uh, I love that, by the way, uh, and I'm not surprised that sucked you in hands, knees and elbows in the end, uh, and now <laughs> you've, walked, you've walked this entire desert. It's become the, the hobby of a lifetime, but, uh, Seminal week, I'm going to argue, for the metals markets that we've just had, uh, starting possibly with the last few days of last week. We we actually got kind of hypey, and we were we were even using the chat AI GBT to do those sort of somewhat baity headlines in our YouTubes to say this is a key moment that is potentially coming technically, macro technically. And I understand you, your man, who isn't shy of the charts. You had a look yourself. I'm interested to hear your views if you see this sudden breakout out of that continuation for gold, which invariably leads before silver, which probably leads before the miners, which is why maybe you haven't yet got the love you deserve and other miners, but that that could be coming on the way. What's your take about, is it a big week that we've just had? Well, Francis, uh, you can look at the, the analysis from short term, you know, the, the, in terms of weeks or medium term in terms of six to 12 months or the long term, which is a decade long, a decade long sort of a scenario. Uh, I think in short, this breakout is, is long being anticipated. I was on a couple of shows last year, uh, in October, calling it bottom of the gold for around 16, 1700 and silver at about $17. And, uh, this year, you know, end of last year, I packed gold at, to take out 2000 and silver to, to take out 30. I think we're uh, very early where, so all these objectives looking to be met gold already, but silver, so to follow, we talked about the gold to silver ratio. Uh, I do believe that this this is going to be the year 2023. Uh, right now, I think specifically to answer your question, the dollar, the dollar. I think you know there's a lot of fundamental news that are out in the market. People talk about the BRICS and uh, the uh, China uh, Russia alliance is out in the open, and the dollar index has had a, a, a double digit correction, percentage correction from what 114 now trading at 101. So it is at that fairly strong trend line was of, of support and the gold is tittering uh breaking out at all time high so you know now as, if you're a trader francis uh, is you know it would be good to take maybe some some chips off the table because you're you're at a at a dollar support and you're at a, a very heavy gold resistance but fundamentally speaking i do expect gold to break out uh over 2000 and um, in, 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 in uh sort of embarking on a 2400 dollar minimum and silver breaking out 30 uh, taking on $50. Now the question is, is, is the market going to sort of revert back to selling main walk away? 
and, and waiting for a September seasonality rally, or it's going to just to carry on, steamroll through, uh, you know, past 2000 and, and, and onto the unknown. I, I don't have the crystal ball, but however, you know, if you look at the 10, if you look at the yields, which is sort of, which is sort of a direction, telling you direction of the dollar, I mean, the yield is also had a, had a big fallback. Uh, my personal view on the, on the yield is, is embarking on a multi-year bull market, which means the treasury is in a, a, in a, in a major bear market because if you look at the yield, it's a 30 year breakout. Yeah. Which means that I think the yield right now is only taking a small breather. I, I don't think the Fed is maybe taking on a pause, but you're not looking at any sort of quantitative easing on the horizon. So then what that means is maybe some of that news on the, on the dollar bear or a lot of that already be factoring into the market. So I would not be surprised to see maybe a bit of consolidation for gold and a bit of a rally in the dollar from here, but it's not a high confidence call because you never want to sort of bet against a bull market being smart, right? However, we're, we're near that major resistance for gold and major sort of a, a, a good support line for, uh, for the dollar prices. Yes, I, I think that's a good summary. I do feel that this we, we we were very early. We were in 2020, the back end of 2020 of August. We were the first and only analysts that we saw that had said the bond market 40-year bull had turned. Now I, my, I'm of the view that that's everybody's opinion. However, we will if we get a bit of a demand-destroying event. We've got labor market data coming out tomorrow. I'm not sure if you, uh, you're familiar with the economic cat, and I'm sure you are, but you might not. Uh, have it at the forefront of your mind um, tomorrow. And uh, there's a lot of whispering, uh, including Goldman Sachs, which often seems to be, you know, the early leak uh, venue for bad numbers, that there could be a big spike in the um, uh, unemployment uh, claims. So we could see during that, because it looks like the 30-year yield, if I had a look at it, in fact, uh, I'll maybe take you to the charts on the 30-year, the because you mentioned rates, which I think is another important thing that the average investor doesn't watch enough, is that this is a debt-based system. Every currency is borrowed into existence. Banks, rates, uh, bonds. It costs uh, money. Usually yes, yeah. 100%. <laughs> um, and it's such an important... And it's such an important... Um, uh, it's such an. I, mean, I think the ten year right now is at about three fifty ish. Ten year and thirty years almost trading. Three fifty. Oh. That's right. We've got uh, three fifty. I'll go to share screen mode. I just want to get the correct uh, chart view before I uh, bring that into image. But this is a breakdown for us. Very technically clear. Um, let me just get that up and go share screen. Um, and you mentioned this, and I'm I'm really grateful that you did that because. I was actually showing this on Twitter to followers and first to my community, in fact, that we are having a downside break here. Uh, this is a long-term bull market in the rates. So this is the 30-year yields. Uh, yeah. And I think they will have to go up again. But we're going to go into our first crisis uh, of, you know, here, this looks like a, a very key break, uh, technically, of a, a very grinding structure that we've had along here. You had the proper slap in the face after reaching for the 4.4s on the 30 that came back really hard and then there's been a squeeze here and now you're leaning on this level and it looks like you're giving up so it looks like the first um fear mode is coming the big question you're going to get out of a lot of the metals uh allies uh silver and gold uh, stackers is are we going to get big price pullbacks now if we go into a fear mode and the stock market sells off we go into let's say a mini or maybe even a, ma a major uh, COVID uh, type event. Let me not use that word, March 22 type uh, equity pullback. Do you think the metals get affected by that? Or will it be like that event of March 2020 where they get a, a temporary spiky effect down and it almost comes back super quick whilst oil itself was smashing to zero and metals continue on on their bull run. So are we is there a possibility we get a similar type price behavior or could they even go just direct to continuing to make their moves up even in a very contractual environment on the basis that people will even further abandon their dollars for precious metals? What's your scenario for if this 30 year continues to bleed down? Yeah, you know what, Francis, on that chart, if you can click on all and see just how the yield has behaved since 1980, I think now yes. that would be... 
I don't know if you can see if you can. Uh, yes, uh, I will bring you more data. And this is the secular reversal you're referring to. Um, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. You can see that the deal actually broke out in 2000, early 2009, about 2019. And, yeah. and it was just somewhat put back, the genie was somewhat put back in the bottle. <laughs> yeah. And now you have a radical breakout on the yield since 1980. It's very clear and plain to see. So yes. from, from this chart, uh, Francis, I don't see a lot of downside on the 30 year. And then if you were, if you were to gauge the market and watch the CNBC and the typical bond manager, I think there's a lot of uh, still a lot of the uh, there's still a lot of the uh, people that are uh, that that are um, that are behind the market. I think we're in a circular uh, bear market for Treasury, and this chart yeah. speaks for for that. So there may be a a bit of a I, and then I mean it's quite a precedent when you see 30, 30 This is thirty year. You went from what uh, sub two percent now to trading it. We're a clip four percent. It's already doubled in, in the, within a year and a half. So it's quite natural to see a bit of consolidation for yields, but you can also see very strong support at the 3% range. I think the problem right. is the slowest we fall, which means the downside of, of, of the downside of the yields or the upside of the treasury is really quite limited. And then fundamentally also for that thesis, you've got what, over 2 trillions of uh, treasury sitting in China, Saudi Arabia, Japan, and and and, and all those people, I, I think they could get out of the treasury if they could in a hurry without much collateral damage and equal happening. So oh, we're just so happy to have a lot of equity market yields. Now, okay. translating to the equity market, if you look at all equity, I think the bottom is in. You can paint a lot of a bare, bearish uh, pictures from the employment, from CPI. Whereas I don't read a lot into those data points like you mentioned, because, I mean, for instance, recalling the days when, I mean, these, these numbers are a lot of this all made up. Like, I was just a bit of a sort of smither that when, 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 when the same pundits were, were were claiming that the CPI was heavily managed, they don't they're not accurate. As soon as CPI goes the way that's that they want to see, then they're almost, you know, bracing us as a Bible. So all those data points only to support uh the guys that are pull that they are pulling the livers, uh, for instance. And the guys that are pulling the livers, their long term what I mean, three to five year horizon objective is to bring the race substantially higher. So they have to they have to uh, they have to manufacture or have to put up the right data points to support what they're doing. However, as I mentioned to you, that the rates already double, so I would not be surprised to see a bit of you know provide a bit of that relief before the next uh, rally in the rates are coming to, that's coming to fruition. On the equity side, it needs not... to rally during that spell whilst we have a little bit of rate pause, pullback, or even pullback. Uh, and then rates to return. But surely when they return again, that's going to be bearish generally, particularly with the tech dominance uh, NASDAQs. Yes and no, Francis. If you look at the NASDAQ, well, I think a good example I will share with you because I was very bearish at S&P and NASDAQ. I said, well, you know what? If, if the yield is 2% and P, P, is, P is, is 20, then if yield goes to 4%, then P has got to go to 10, right? It, it, just, it just yields. But if you look at the real estate market, especially in Asia, they're not falling, even though the yield has more than double. And so I, I think from that token, I'm not particularly bearish at the equity market because they're quasi-tangible -ten assets. They're still assets. And then if you look at the, if you look at the charts technically, they're both S&P, Dow, and uh, NASDAQ, S &S -S 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 NX100, they're all up, well above 50-day and 200-day moving average. So if you're a trader, you got you got to follow the trends. And the trends are that the equity market broke down, broke, broke, uh, broke out of their consolidation correction range that started from the COVID and they're on the, tr on the way to go up. And then if you look at, so also in the 1970s and eighties, during a period of stagnation, uh, of inflation and, and little growth, equity never crashed. So the way I look at it is we're going to be during a consolidation range. You're going to have sector rotations amongst stables amongst uh, traditional industries, amongst tech, and this money is going to be rotating back and forth. You're not going to see a breakdown, I don't think, nor you're going to see any sort of breakup or upside. That's my view. Yeah. Uh, funny enough, I find equities the least, the general equities, the least interesting place, the indices. Uh, but I am a bit uncertain because I feel personally that if, if we have a demand-destroying event uh, brought on us, a bank failure, and we could go into panic selling. 
I think that remains a possibility. But I also within that recognize that there is a inflationary environment and where do people put their money and debt isn't it anymore. For me, the whole wall has been dropped on debt. And to a lot of people, particularly in the States, it's an equity culture. Um, yep. But when you look at valuations, I do feel that eventually the US markets have to stagnate. And if you look at demographics, a lot of it is held locally and a lot of people are now withdrawing from the system uh, as pensioners. Peak pensioner pot was passed last year, December of the boomer generation. So it's going to become a retirement village to a degree, the States, and that's not new investment nearly as much uh, as old. So I'm I'm a little bit more a little bit less bullish the equities than you, but I, I don't think it's the most interesting place. I mean, precious metals have got to be uh, it uh, for us. Surely, when will the miners turn? And let's have a look at silver because one of the things you mentioned is that we're all we're both passionate about silver. We've got a strong handle above twenty five now. So this is a chart I'm pretty sure you'll know well. And do tell the guys, where, where are your holdings? It's quite interesting. Um, you were saying you passed through Panama on the way to Bolivia. I think that's one of your strongest holdings, uh, Latin America. Yes. Well, I think first, let's go back to the equity market. Uh, I top yep. over 40 countries. I lived uh, you know, in, in Europe for several years, in Asia and in, in, in North America. A couple of points I want to bring up and highlight is S&P 500s. Uh, over 50% of SP 500 revenues are coming out of are, are, are derived internationally, not, not domestically in the U.S. Yes, so there's a dollar of hedge in that. Right. So the second point here is that if you look at some of the hyperinflating countries, like if you look at the times when Argentina was, was imploding or Brazil or even Russia, their equity market is actually outperforming. It's actually breaking the house. So in an era of inflation, uh, equity market tend to actually not – like I said, it's not an interesting market, but but it's definitely not a. You definitely want to be cautious if you're if you're if you if you subscribe too much about Peter Schiff or the Robert Kiyosaki side, which I don't, I am not in that camp. That if you if you want to shore, you got to really pick your spot very very carefully because yeah. you can get sort of you can get enrolled into your sort of a self sort of reflecting point of view that that's that's not what the market is telling you. so on a big time frame that's a hammer there uh there's a spinning top and we got a little bit of two reasonably strong green months here after a big yeah. head and shoulder correction so when you've just made a head and shoulders target you tend to get a rally that doesn't mean it's the end of the bearishness you're certainly looking like you've got on a pretty big time frame i'll just go back to the, the show the head and shoulders that uh was there You've certainly performed to that head and shoulders and you've rallied well significantly back up after that sell. You no, know that looks like a reverse shoulder and hold that looks like a reverse head and shoulder with the neckline that's about to break out to me. <laughs> but, yeah, th this is what this is what you're saying. So let me just draw that. Yes. On the other neckline, do we have a left and a head and are we making another inverted? We come up to the same neckline for one oh five that was the bearish uh structure uh over there and could this be a pivoting level actually and it's an interesting observation uh and to that act, to act. that first, if you look at international markets such as such as uh south such as south korea taiwan or even shanghai and hong kong they, they are they are a bit more bottom they're just coming out of the bottom so they're not they're not rallying as strongly as smp has so that's telling me that uh there's a lot of pent up demand in asia that had not been maybe fully reflective of, of the S&P. And that's that's providing support and fuel for the S&P. I mean, a lot of the countries in the Asia is coming out of the COVID restriction and you're seeing very robust uh, 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 sort of a cons consuming market in Asia. So that's something not to take into view. Yes, yes. I've, I've just brought up the COSPI for interest because we have a view on the Korean one and it's been very interesting uh, markets. But this had a downside setup that we saw perform it sold off and it actually overperformed to its target. And since then, it's also doing a very similar uh, yep. potential reversal structure. Uh, again, pivoting in and around the level there. So you're getting a bit of a double bottom with left and right shoulder, left shoulder, W. It's quite bullish to me. And a right <laughs> shoulder. And it also looks reasonably bullish. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not an indice uh, shorter right now. And I would argue there's even a couple of longs to be had in this environment, which points to that rate 
uh, potential uh, pivots, that pivot on rate opinion turning, certainly for the US, Cosby looks uh, good uh, to me. And you're also mentioning other Asians. And, and it has. Well, Wes, let, me share, let, me share, let me share with you a secret, then we can go into silver. If you look at it, if you stay in Cosby right now, just pretend that you can actually raise the Cosby on the bot of the top left corner and pretend this is your, let's just think about, let's think about, let's pick a, a, a market of which you're most bullish off. Okay, say gold. So if you'd imagine this is not a Cosby chart, but instead of this is a gold chart, we will be hopping all over. It's, oh my God, this is reverse head and shoulder. This is going to yeah. imminent nick out. So I think a lot of times we got to call yeah, the charts yeah, yeah. as it is, right? And not have any pre predisposition on, on no, 100%. what is yes. yes. tied to the corner. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's very scientific. You've got to remove. You've got. I like looking at charts before I know the name, because exactly. then you don't have you don't have any bias. I'm not an inherent perma bear on indices. I think that's a that's a <laughs> that's a journey to the poor house, uh, if ever you want one. Um, and I actually Let's see. Talk silver. Yeah, let's go to silver because that's uh, where we're going to have our metals uh, friends are going to be really happy to have someone with real experience in managing a silver mine um, and their their views. So this one already has quite a lot of draws on it. Um, and we're seeing this very impulsive move. We've got this capping descending line here, which seems to en encapsulate the pause period. Because it was quite a lengthy pause. It was a bit of a, for many new metals uh, buyers, they were really bummed out by that. So, you know, especially if you're from the crypto markets where, you know, when moon type category they've been really walking a desert over here we had an inverted head and shoulder again we seem to be talking about those a lot made the target there then pulled back to the neckline and now we're spitting up so i i kind of feel the running of a 25.7 which doesn't look a long way off we have 25.1s going on one going on twos uh will will be a technical break that we've already had on gold so let me just jump between the gold and silver just to highlight that I'll take the eye off there and just do it on the overlay draw because I've got a lot of work on there. It's kind of a messy chart. But we've had that triggering event on gold already with gold being the leader. Um, and it does, does feel like silver is now coming for its own. Being the higher beta version, it had a, a, a deeper dip. What's your take? Uh, fire away. The John Lee take. Yeah, for instance, if you look at the silver, when I call at the bottom, I came on a couple other shows in back uh, October of last year. You can Google me on YouTube. And it was quite clear that, well, first of all, gold and silver market are heavily managed. That's why you yeah. see all this volatility on the upside. And the managers, let's call them the managers, will actually deliberately fuel the market, even on the upside, to try to, to, try to establish a top to exhaust the buying for the yeah. metal. And from there, they're going to start picking away by shorting the futures and the ETFs. Now, yeah. October 2022 was the bottom for gold and silver, and that was coinciding with the top of the dollar. And the dollar was stretched, I think, about 114. That's as high as you could. I, I don't see, I wasn't seeing much more upside on the dollar. And, and that's why I was calling the bottom for gold. But subsequently, if you look at the short term, I mean, the next, I would say, four to six weeks, uh, they're hitting the resistance level, right? Uh, gold is hitting the all time high resistance. And uh, typically, when you have a you know, historic uh, <laughs> uh, sort of a uh, the highest level is going to take some time. Well, maybe a couple more tries to overcome. And the silver is, is lagger to gold and it is hitting at that $25 congestion level. It has not hit over 30 yet. And um, I think right now it's maybe a, a type of caution. I would not be surprised to see a bit of a flow, bar, a flow back and a bit of a rally for the dollar. And the dollar is at about 101. So it's, it's at the bottom of that trading band between 100 to 110. So I'll not be surprised to see a little bit of of of, of, of the rally on the dollar and subsequently put the pullback on gold and silver. But that is a low confidence call, Francis, because yeah. we are in a very fundamentally strong metals market. Uh, however, then on the other side, if you look at the factoring into the seasonality, there's the proverb the proverbial selling main walk away. So I think it's, I'm I'm sort of a mix. If that's a traditional market. equities measure. I'm not sure miners have always followed that. They followed the 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 the, the, the industry more. Surely, the sell in May and go away is a disinterest. It's Northern Hemisphere taking summer basically, uh, because yeah. of they they were all, all off during August and they start to wind back down. What do you make of the gold silver ratio? Uh, we've had we've got our own technical view, but I don't want to contaminate uh, your opinion where do you, what do you think on this 
Surely this was yeah, a blow so and the terminal of it. Yeah, I mean, go to silver ratio is, is at about 80 right now. He went as high as 100. And at 100, it, it is a very, I think there's only two or three times in history that that, that ratio is hit that high. So yes. usually on a high gold to silver ratio tells me that there is more fear than greed in the market. And that, and that I do expect silver to outperform by, by the time it's all said and done. However, the, the ratio is telling me right now there's not a lot of speculative uh, interest from when I say speculator or generalist funds or retail. There's not a lot of speculation in the market right now, uh, in the metals market. And, and yeah. when that happens, when you see a lot of uh, uh, sort of froth in the market, and then you're going to see a lot lower uh, gold and silver ratio down to 50 or 60. So the market is telling right now that uh, gold is gold is still trading at a premium to silver, and there's a reason for that. Besides, you know, the, besides there's a lot of beer in the market, not so much. Well, it's the central bank, market. surely. Central bank buying it will be gold, the predominant yeah, but, move. But you know, there's also a factor on silver that's placed sort of pressure on silver. If you look at copper, right? I mean, the the, the world is going through, the the world is going through slacks. Like there is not a, a lot of demand out there in construction. In infrastructure, China is cooling down rapidly, and uh, there's not a, just whole construction activities. There's just not a lot of infrastructure, and the people say uh, copper is is the doctor for gauging in the health of the world economy, and, and copper is copper is you know, you know not not do, copper is sort of you know doing doing so so. So I think in terms of uh, analyzing for silver, it's got still seventy percent industrial demand, and uh, I think always. It's, I think the uh, the speculative investment demand is kind of slow, slowly going to tail over the balance, but for now the industrial demand is putting that lid and and pressuring silver market. And that's why gold right now is performing better than silver. And as you mentioned about the central banks, that's another different factor. I mean, silver investors are very different from gold investor, and gold is a central bank uh, play. And uh, and right now though, Francis, you know, there's there's stories about. 60% of the gold purchase is anonymous sources speculated by central banks. My take on that is, Francis, actually, my thoughts are this actually more, people are front running the central banks. People know the, the imminent central bank diversification and the politicians and the, the many, you know, the well-connected Warren Buffett's networks. So the guys are stealthy accumulating gold before the inevitable happened. Uh, with the central and, and is that going hand in hand with a dumping of treasuries, particularly U.S. Uh, debt? Yep. Well, when you see that, when you see the headlines of, of Russia buying gold or Brazil buying gold, that is when that's going to be. By then, gold is already broken out. So right now, we're still tittering on on that stealthy phase, and and we're not. I, we haven't seen anything resemble a top for gold. My call on gold this year is minimum twenty four hundred. Earlier, I had said call that. 2000 back only five months ago people nobody believed me so we're very close and tiny and calling the bottom for gold but this year i think gold is going to easily take out 2000 and make an all-time high and establish a new high i i don't know whether it's 2400 or 3000 nobody knows as i said for instance the cartel is going to feel the fire until the exhaust of the per, of the buying we don't know what that happens everybody's going to wake up with, with their fingers crossed you know hoping for the for the for the exhaust of, of, of the purchasing interest. And the way you can tell that, Francis, would be the volume on the Connex and the and the, MLA, and the uh, LBMA and the LME. So once you see the volume start taping out, concurring with the top of the market, that's that's when you know that the gold and silver tops are in. But we do expect a very uh, uh, a very major bull ride coming this year. I'm very, very bullish, Francis, of gold and silver this year. Excellent. Yeah, it sounds it sounds indeed that way. Um, how you tell us a little bit about your own company and valuation? I think you said something quite extraordinary. Ounces in the ground. How did you verify that? How much does your business have, and what is the valuation per ounce in the ground that you're currently being afforded on your own uh, holding? Because that's apart from a, a slightly an opportunity, I suppose, to promote your investment, uh, silver uh, elephant mines. It's also the GDXJ where people, the junior miners, where, you know, you, you're not really getting much fizz out of this not particularly sexy chart at this juncture yet. 
But if if some of the things that you mentioned come to fruition and you start to get 45s on silver and 2,500s, we actually see uh, the doorstep of three grand. We see two nine in 18 months um, and maybe sooner. Uh, what leverage you get with the more marginal players and use your own company as an example. Uh, how many ounces do you have in the ground? Start with that. Well, yeah, Elephant's a project in Bolivia. The name is Tulakail. It's over $50 million investment, over 100,000 meters of drilling in the ground. 100,000 meters, 100,000. It's, it's 100 kilometers of drilling. So you can imagine how much stuff is being drilled in the ground with over 100 million ounces of silver that's being verified independently. Uh, with how, how do you verify that? Is that geostatistics, samples, et cetera? In other words, it's not... It's it's likely. It's a probability based assessment, or is yeah, it instance, quite like, factual? Yeah, I mean, you drill, you, you drill with within a, so like to 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 establish a measure indicated resource. Typically, you would drill with a twenty five meter density, so which means yeah. that if you have a volume, if you that's just imagine for the sake of an example, it's an open pit style. It's a very consistent mineralization. Then you're looking at a block of volume. It could you could be about fifty in, in silver elements case it could be fifty million tons. Okay, right. so fifty million ton of dimensional block of rocks in in the ground, and then you multiply by the average grade per ton of of, of silver and gold in, in silver elements case would be about about a hundred grams. Then you will count and hundred grams three ounces. So if you multiply three ounces by the by the amount by the by the tonnage. Then you come up with the uh, then you come up with the uh, then you come up with that resource estimate. Okay, and uh, another analogy would be hundred million. Another analogy would be another one hundred million. Be, yep, that that you had a, a, a estimate in in there ounces. Hundred twenty million ounces altogether of that okay. hundred million okay. ounces yeah. the high confidence level, and then the twenty million ounces in the less confidence level, and the way you establish the confidence level is based on the drill density. Because the the, 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 the the closer the spacing of the drill holes, then the more confident you are in the in the metals in the ground. Gotcha. So if I just took 110, let's say I half the 20, uh, and I multiplied it by a $45 uh, price. But then, of course, the, the, the cost, what is your co average cost for extraction at the moment? Because, you know, we've seen First Majestic at the moment. They've got a project that's absolutely killing them. Uh, and yeah. has got, you know, uh, it's well above Jared the price Canyon. of gold and silver to Jared Canyon, that's right, uh, to to retain. So they, I mean, they, they, it's non-profitable. It's sucking out cash. It's taking the profits generated from other sites. Uh, what's cost for extraction for you at the moment? Or, yeah, have you mined and brought see. above ground, first of all? You have the, got that far? You are that that stage mine? No, we're not. We're pre-production stage. Pre so you're looking, yeah. at, you're looking at a piece of land. Yeah. And what do you oh, estimate? Yeah. What do you right. estimate? I think you're over over 25 years. Uh, I met Keith Neumeyer before he started First Majestic. So I've been around him for a while. Uh, it's more of art than science. I mean, even the shrewdest people, smartest people like, like Keith clearly had miscalculated the cost uh, and, the, and the sort of economics of Jerry Canyon. So it's, yeah. it's more than art than science. Um, and, and nobody, like, it's... You can you can take a piece of paper called feasibility study. You, you can quote the numbers, but given this inflationary environment and and uh, you know cost factors all over the place with extended delays, I would not actually venture to guess what our uh, what our sort of uh, ec the project economics will be in terms of the capex and opex in terms of like how much money to to to, to get the money out of the ground and, and to start the operation and how much cost how much per ounce is your cost or what is your margin yeah. per, per ounce but i would say this i don't think any miners right now if you look at the charts of mining companies who you talked about francis that they are i don't think anybody's making money on the 25 dollars silver you know they're like they're not they're and they're they're rate they're many to pretty a lot of capital expenses to make sure that the mine can continue to operate and not to bleed cash uh just to go to show that the gold and silver right now, despite their break, gold is near breaking an all time high, but they're not catching up with the cost of operation. No. Uh, so a couple so, of other things, as you touch on, which I'll bring very quickly. The way you value gold and silver companies, there's two ways to value them. One is one is cash flow, okay? 
and 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 then you tack a PE on that and you do a sort of a, a back of the envelope uh, NPV and IRR based on the reserves and based on your price projection you come up with cash flow and you tack a PE on that for gold and silver maybe 20 to 40 and for base metals maybe PE will be slightly lower but the other but but that's only part of it the other way you, the other side of you measuring gold and silver companies are is the optionality aspect so optionality is is kind of like the option trader right so let's say Dell computer is trading at forty dollars, and you you actually paying a premium to buy uh, a, a Dell Dell os, options to buy sometime in the future at forty five. You have to pay to 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 buy a call option at forty five dollars. That's above what Dell computer is trading. So the way you look at the junior market uh, pre production stage company like Silver Elephant, of which right now the market cap is twenty million, it's got hundred hundred million ounces of silver. Just call it that. We're paying twenty cents an ounce of silver in the ground. So it's a key, it's a key to you're paying what a dollar or two dollar on a call option for Dell computer at forty dollar trading. So yeah. so that 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 so what makes it intriguing, interesting, and speculative is that it's it's not so much the 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 uh, the cash flow or a, a PE ratio of of, of of mining company, but it's how you how you calculate the call option of the uh, of lease prices in the ground, what you anticipate the gold silver prices to be in the future. And then, and then, how much? I mean, you know, you can buy a, a higher quality silver asset with fewer ounces in the ground. That just means that your strike price is closer to, uh, to the call up, call prices right now. Or you can buy it slightly out of the money, uh, higher uh, resources, but but maybe cost a little bit more to extract. Um, and so that is both art and science. Prices. If you if you trade options, you know the volatility and the the uh, the uh, you know the, you, you calculate the black shoe model. And and it's all over the place, right? It, it could it could it's all over the place, which is what we're doing right now. And if you talk, you look at the the junior mining ratio. But if you, if you look at gold and XAU ratio, if you subtract the gold versus junior miner or XAU or HUI, they're at very very low level. You know, they're at the bottom in in almost or maybe already broken down their consolidation rate. So I mean that tells you two things, right? Either the junior miner, mining company is telling you that the imminent bear market is on the horizon for gold and silver, which I don't believe to be the case. Or the other, the other case would be that maybe gold and silver only embarking on a, they're yet to break out and market don't believe they're breaking out and that yeah. the market sometimes they're wrong and that if they break out, then there's a lot of catch up to do in the junior mining and the, in the mining sector. For instance, where I see things that have been around for 25 years, this is a very, very similar an idea to say to uranium um, almost 10 years ago. back in 20, 20 years ago it's not even 10 years ago it's 20 years ago back in 2020 back in 2002 when gordon brown found that last batch of gold from back in england at 250 an ounce and the, and it was very clear it's a clear the bottom is in the 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 equity market is top the dollar is top and the hegemony is broken down you know bill clinton was the president it was as good as you could get in the fiat system and, yeah. and nobody loved gold and silver. It's very, very similar. I see that deja vu from 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 my from my lens. And and, yeah. and and what's happened right now is because you have the carnage from 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 the uh, from the cryptocurrencies. You have the carnage from the fallout of the equity market. You have COVID, and and you also have this demographics of the shift. The 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 uh, the uh, the baby boomers are retiring. They see gold and silver as mining companies, speculative assets. So they're they want anything to do with that. But it's very akin to 2002, 2003, when the bull market started, they just lost so much money in the metal, in the mining space. So, so there's not, there's a lot of, think about a lot of babies are needing milk, needing milk, but just not so much milk that's available. <laughs> so, and, and that's why you see pockets of uh, mining uh, uh, companies that have, you know, have, have sort of gotten good garter, good volume, but majority of that, First logistics is a good example. They're still in that consol consolidation range. They're very a lot closer to the bottom. They're twenty percent of the bottom, about seventy percent on the top. <laughs> For instance, however, I, I don't want to preface also saying that I think once gold breaks out of two thousand, right now it's, it's near all time high. But if it does break out of twenty one hundred, then the market rec will recognize that they were wrong about the mighty equity, and then they're going to catch up very very quickly. And the the interesting thing is. All the junior, all the mining companies in the world is after from Microsoft. So you're 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 going to see a lot of buying siphoned through a very small thin straw 
and you're going to see some very spectacular spectacular performance on the mining sector just like it was in 2004 2005 when silver staged a rally from i remember 450 to 15 dollars in a or like in less than 18 months you can see something very similar in replay there's very little one in answer right yeah, no, but it does, uh, I can see it in the sense that even while the metals are getting their recognition, miners in many cases have forward sold future production at pre, uh, you know, lower levels. The market is fatigued uh, with equities in the mining space more than they are with the metal, even though they can see the fiat system failure uh, and they're happy to hold gold. They're not yet ready to deal with these companies that have burnt their hands so many times yep. that have seen these hyperinflationary costs climb up uh, in the form of the industrial metals like copper and other things, uh, energy that mines consume uh, really aggressively. And in actual fact, it seems it seems almost like your project should remain, I don't want to say mothballed, it's not mothballed, but non-production until such time as you start to have some real price discovery on the underlying uh, metal in the ground. Um, uh, and then you can. And so for instance, what, what, what we're doing now is, is, is it's a bit of a cliche, but the risk, the risk, the project. So what I mean by that is we will maintain an excellent local community relationship. We are advancing in near completion of all of our permitting process to make sure the projects want to call the shovel ready. And then when we capture the silver market, which is 20% from the top, right now we're 20% from the bottom, but when silver price is 20% from the top, I would say that we're not measuring into any sort of production discussion and at least $30 silver. Because yeah. uh, I think to put a mine into production with this price volatility, with all the sort of uncertainties of, of, of construction delays and all that mobility, labor, work, stoppage, you know, health mandates, it'll be suicidal to do that. And unfortunately for us, it's exactly what happened in the last 18 months. You're seeing a number of juniors that had gone into uh, that, that didn't survive onto the other side because they were busy commissioning golden and, you know, their, their project. And you've got a couple of down in the silver price down to $16. They registered a couple of quarter of losses and then, you know, they're breached their covenants. Their debtors come calling and that's the end of the story, unfortunately. <laughs> There's several of those that went on. Yeah. And you have to avoid that false start. And being such a volatile underlying, even to gold, which has got some volatility, it's, it's even more dangerous. You need to get deeper into the black zone in price to allow for much higher percentage leverage pullbacks in these demand destroying events uh, and these ups and downs. But at the same time, if you get it right, Surely that should be uh, the lottery ticket for your great great grandkids. Uh, even never mind enough wealth to see you to a comfortable retirement. Well, Francis, if you if you if you that's that's sort of a step into the op options rail, right? In, in, for junior miners or for mining company, if you have a hundred million ounce discovery, such as the what, the discovery that we silver elephant had, typically in a mine plan design. Uh, I saw the more, I need to know more than I want to know in the last 13 years of running a company. The mine design is usually running for a 10 year mine. So the optimal design for a mine with 100 million ounces of, of silver resource would be 10 million ounces of silver production per year. So for a minute, imagine that, that the mine actually goes into production at an annual production rate of 10 million ounces a year. And it, I, I just had a break even price of $30 to account for inflation. So if, if silver does go to fifty dollars at a three thousand dollar goal, and 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 that would that in, in that case the the, the gold to silver ratio would be about what sixty, which is quite reasonable. Yeah. And you're looking at uh, you look at two hundred million a year dollar margin of 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 of, of a two hundred million dollar cash flow at a fifty dollar silver price, and a two hundred million dollar uh, uh cash flow for a silver company would have a PE ratio of about thirty on average. You're looking at a company of six billion dollar market cap, <laughs> and no, as high as no. thirty. Would you say as high as thirty, given the volatility no, of price? Sometimes fifty, Francis. Really? Uh, the ratio, the the typical uh, PE ratio for a gold and silver mining company is at around thirty. For copper, it's about lower at around ten to twenty. Why is why is it such a high uh, P ratio? I thought uh, I'm, uh, this is I'm learning here, so forgive me uh, for lack of knowledge. Then, 
But uh, I, I've always considered, you know, that if the SMP was at an average of 30, it's way it's overpriced uh, at PE. Why would metals be different and higher in valuation? Um, because it's got a 10-year life and it's over. I mean, it's not like Microsoft, which is going to keep selling Word and Excel for, and I'm funny, I'm even using a, a tech example because they have a short life cycle. It's not Coca-Cola, for example, that has a brand and will be selling bottles every year. How, how does that come about that you get such good uh, gearing? Yeah, well, PE ratio, remember, that's based on the E today, not on the yeah. E tomorrow. Now, yeah. E to go up for a re for, for a high-tech company like Tesla because people are thinking that it's going to sell more cars. So it's going to bring their future revenue. The future PE will be, will be so the, the, the present PE is a lagger to the future. Yeah. For gold mining companies, people are always thinking, you're not going to mine more gold per se, but the gold price is going to go up. So the future cash flow, the future earnings, I thought, could be a lot more than the present earnings. And, and that's Even why with a 10-year cutoff point, I mean, because Tesla will have new models. They won't, they're won't. they not dying in 10 years. I mean, the mine will be exhausted in 10 years. It has a much shorter lease on life. Uh, I, I just find that the, uh, that part I found aggressive. Nothing else in your calculation seemed aggressive. 200 million cash flow. I could see silver through 50 um, in three, four years significantly. Uh, the only question is the inflationary aspects as well. Will it be allowed to accelerate away from that uh, and to continue suggesting the higher E? I think it can too. It could get to 100 uh, and we, you know, the whole concept of a dollar is going to change. I mean, a hundred dollars. Exactly. You're measuring dollar. Dollar yeah, might exactly. exist 10 years. Well, what will you buy with a dollar? You won't buy anything with a single dollar <laughs> and 10 bucks won't pay for, you know, uh, someone to clean your windscreen. Uh, well, so who knows? Real quick, you know, Francis, it's the market is saying that Tesla's PE should be two thousand and Coca Cola's PE should be fifteen. And the market, based on, based on my research and based on the last twenty years, is saying that the PE for gold companies should be thirty and for copper companies should be fifteen and for coal companies, coal like black coal should be five, right? And then yeah. they could be right and they could be wrong. One thing is, Francis, is uh, the uh, the mining sector is one of the most asymmetrical sector, and so this always the information is always very asymmetrical, and that's why the timing you have to be very good on timing in the commodity in the commodity business. And the other point is about you know talk about a two billion dollar market cap. When I first got into the silver business in two thousand two two thousand three, I knew a person by the name of Ree Fun. He's a very good friend of mine. And um, he had discovered a mine in China, and they they started out with a forty fifty million dollar market cap. I put a private placement in their company at seventy five cents, and then uh, the silver price they run from uh, four dollars to twenty seventeen dollars in two thousand and seven, and their company went from thirty million to two billion, and their their annual production is at around uh, ten million ounces, uh, including byproducts. So this is not some hearsay or some fairy tale. Yeah. This is. If you look at first logistic as well, right? That's another good example um, up there. I remember first logistic when IPO. I think it was around two thousand four, two thousand and five, when when their stock is at around uh, three dollars uh, and uh, three dollars a share. That's before they even went on the uh, New York Stock or or Nike Exchange. They were just trading on the Toronto Stock Exchange. But you are also right that there is that depletion uh, a factor in, in in that in in the modeling. In that, in that the mine would deplete eventually, it's a burning match. And that's why this, this is another reason I said that the industry is very asymmetrical. Even the industry experts can get it wrong, such as Keith with the Jerry Kenny. And, uh, and, uh, and you know, the, the, the sort of, the answer to address the, the, the reserve depletion is you've got to look at the quality of the asset. Maybe there's a lot of potential to expand the asset resource. And you also got to look at a management that's very shrewd in, in looking at quality assets to acquire at the bottom of the cycle and not at the top. So there's a lot of, it's a very, uh, I often say, for instance, coming from the dot-com industry in the, in the early nineties, when I semi retired, that if, you, if you can make a, if you are, if you can be successful in mining, you can, you know, it can be a successful in a lot of other uh, things. Yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah. it's not easy. It's not easy. <laughs> the, the great irony now is never before have I personally felt that a, a small cap silver mine could be better positioned than right now. I think you're about to come in to all-time lows and uh, without understanding the, the, the minutiae of the day-to-day -day mining management and the fundamentals, 
for timing and recognizing that in timing because you had the same thing in uranium and yellow cake and the, yep. the ex-Soviet unions overhang having to be burnt off and it was a dead industry and now the total sum of uranium miners were less than a single uh, you know market cap for uh, Exxon Oil which is also an energy company only you know those uranium could power I don't know how many more more burn more flames and keep more homes warm. So you get these huge macro distortions. They're so hated, so ignored. Uh, and I, I think with the, the metals just starting, um, this has got to be one of the best times uh, to be uh, positioned. And your 15-year wait may uh, finally be coming to fruition. And you, a couple, well, I've learned a couple of things. And that's why I said this is a deja vu of 2002-2003. Because I think the pre-acts in 1998, people lost I their share. You know, the, the bulls, the bulls of 1980, they were still riding and they're just like, oh my God, you know, I'm only three years away from kicking the bucket, right? They're just, they're exhausted. Um, and, and, uh, and this is exactly what I, like, it's almost a deja vu. This is exactly what I see. People that got into gold and silver in 2002, they're back to where they started. Their mining shares are lower when they started in 2002, in several instances. They're just like, I'm done with this. And a, a lot of them kick the bucket, is, uh, unfortunately. And uh, and then the, the new generations are still in crypto. They're not even going into the mining space yet. And now it's a it's a buyer's market. <laughs> right? so this is absolutely the buyer's market. However, uh, the junior market is not for faint-hearted. There's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of obstacles to put a mining into production, and that is sounds very difficult. So right now, I want to recommend. Uh, uh, and that's increased. I don't want to this, uh, can I jump in? Sorry. That's increased with all this ESG stuff, hasn't it? Immensely. Oh, my God. Uh, and haven't they just added another layer of cost and extended the cycle to actually get something in? So uh, that, that's a big spoiler that people will be going through things that even veterans haven't gone through before in terms of having to go through this uh, process. You're absolutely right. So let me, let me finish my thought. I'll get into the ESG. Um, Francis... Like to get a mine for 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 the mines that we operate in Mongolia and Canada in the United States, it's taken them ten years to get to where we are, from the previous operator to the ones we inherited over, and now just to to uh, to put a mine into production from the day of discovery is going to take you more than ten years. It was taking you ten years; it's going to take you fifteen to twenty years, and uh, and it's just the bureaucracies and everything. Um, and that's why I advocate for people that get into the junior mining space for the first time is put more eggs in the basket. So I would never sort of, you know, pounding my chest to say put all the money in silver elephant. And so you got to put more eggs in your basket, different jurisdiction, different different sort of stage of the project. But I will recommend right now it's such a buyer's market. You 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 can go after assets already had a proven discovery. So right, for instance, you don't need to be speculating on whether they have silver in the ground. There's already stories out there with silver is in the ground, and you just got to make sure the management execute the business strategy to make sure that they can come through with a permit and 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 then you know either buy out or or, or ability to to raise more money in the market to put the money into production. I think that's the first thing. I want to talk about ESG. Unfortunately, you got this ESG layer layer on top of us. Either you believe in 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 in, in environmental, social, and governance or climate change, it is coming, okay? It is, it is, it is here. Uh, for a company, even without production, we now, in order to get audited and to be certified, to be signed off as a puppet listed company, we have to produce an ESG report. And uh, so you're absolutely right. There's an extra layer. And even in the auditing industry, in the audit, in the, sort of being a puppet listed company, the uh, government is, uh, is a, uh, is uh, tightening the, the industry. So there is government auditor, um, the auditor itself, which means that there's fewer partners that can be assigned to a mining to, to, to audit. So I think overall, for instance, what I see is a very clear trend of, 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 of cost of doing business going up uh, amongst other things, which is only going to exacerbate inflation as it's coming downstream. And I was going to just add that whilst that's a downside, it increases the lag time to bring new production online. So the price when it does run could run a lot further because you've got all these built-in obstacles for the pr price normally fix supply issues. But when you add 
further buffers of obstacles to be covered uh, and all these additional bottlenecks, it means you need a, a much larger price and you almost need a complete bottleneck emergency where the, the ESG guys are eventually told, if you don't wave this through, forget about your battery car, forget about your battery thing. You need to start dropping these obstacles. You need to start giving some permits. Um, and you get to this backlash uh, ESG. And we've already had a little bit of that against wind farms, how ineffective they are, killing birds, da 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 da, burning up in flames, etc. So it's kind of almost that we'll need to have this reality check. And in the meantime, price just really rockets so that by the time you do get going, it's just cream and honey. You know, Francis, it's uh, first of all, this barriers to entry. And uh, so, you know, the ESG is going to create barriers to entry. Once the train leaves the station, another train is not going to come to, to carry passengers, right? So the investment opportunity is also so limited. Um, it's not just ESG. There is First Nations consultation. You know, a lot of the local people that are become a lot aware of, 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 of all the environmental aspects of commissioning in mind. So there's a lot of complexity and it's going to be a lot more challenging going forward. Even in the United States, I don't think there's been a mine that's been commissioned in the United States uh, in the last year under the Biden administration. So from permitting, from, from ESG, from First Nations consultation, it's going to take a lot more time. Now, a couple of interesting aspects I want to share with you. Uh, mining is almost like a vicious cycle or, or virtuous cycle. So when, when, when the prices go up, even existing mining companies will be reluctant to increase production. They want to throttle. They want to squeeze. They want to squeeze their production because they don't need to. They don't need to put in more production because they get a higher price. They can deliver their their mar they can deliver their earnings through higher prices. And consequently, prices when the price is in a downward spiral, the mining company will actually fuel to the fire on the downside because their margin is shrinking. Not to mine more, so it's a vicious cycle. So you you not only have this barrier to entry, but the mining company sells this. It's not going to, you don't have to worry about their extending production to, 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 to make more money because their money is already being made through the higher, through the higher share price. And you are also right about the, the, uh, this is what I call, what I call right now is demand destruction coupled with supply disruption. And because, you know, all the, just the logistics of, and, 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 you know, the mandates and the blockage and the, the health mandates, all that is causing disruption, but we have a demand destruction at the same time. So we're going to go through still a period of, of this volat price volatilities, but I, I do see that the demand destruction, I do see that the supply disruption is also going to be eventually causing supply literally stoppage. So, so eventually I think the supply side is going to be, uh, it's going to go down faster than the demand destruction. It's a classic yes. economics 101. So right now we're still seeing this this balance right now. You, you're not you're gonna see it outright. Infl you're gonna see runaway inflation, but not maybe in, in a year or two. But then usually gold and silver they're 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 front running the market, right? So you, this is a foretelling sign that you're gonna have a uh, you know quite serious inflation that's taking place. But, but um and, and right now it's curtailed by the demand destruction. But but eventually the supply is gonna dwindle. You you're, you're not gonna see people you're not gonna see people like. Throw four or five billion dollar bit of new mine. That's going to take you used to take two years. Not going to take five years. It's just not going to happen, uh, Francis. Yeah. And when you're not going to find just, banks. You're not certainly uh, not going to find banks in retreating banks lending that. It has the to banks be, used to go like two percent. Now it's LIBOR plus six. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's, your your cost has gone up in, in all. And that's another thing, Francis. People say you know what you're going to raise interest rates to. To uh, to stifle inflation. In fact, interest rates are saying higher interest is going to fuel inflation because your cost of doing business go up and to service debts like a lot of the Dow 30 and S&P 500 laden with debt, they're going to have to adjust the price upwards to service their debts. So raising interest rate doesn't necessarily is going to cause you lower interest rate. A lot of interesting dynamics to play, Francis. So. I've got two big fundamental questions I'd like to run past you. Let's start with the one I'm on a more macro basis. Supply of above ground silver. This seems to be the thing that nobody really wants you to know the look. number. Uh, and I, uh, I would like to know your best guess because you, as, a, as a thinking smart man, you've got to have kicked those tires before. And people, uh, and then the 
overall view of projection of the increase of its just silver's role in things like solar panelization, um, Tesla cars, how much do they actually use? Uh, surely it's more than a ICE car, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so demand projection versus what's currently, if nobody's supplying, what is the number approximately that can be called on? Global above ground production. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about silver. I did a lot of study on above ground silver inventory and we have address studies from Ted Butler. Nobody knows. Um, two things. I, I think first, people that, Francis, it's my belief. Well, gold and silver is money. Okay, the real people know. So it's my belief that gold and silver prices are suppressed and and <laughs> through a various means. And the people that are the back end, people are, 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 are the trucks show up at the refineries. 60, my belief is 60, 70% of gold is, well, not from shell silver because it's industrial, but it's about gold. And to some extent, silver. People are buying on a truckload. There's no intention to exchange for a fiat. You know, like we talk about the future of the dollar. So even if we know a number of, say, silver and gold, I don't, I, there may, I don't think there may not be actually a, so a price to point flow. Of, so some of it's going to be held. Market. They're yeah, not going to come out yeah. the market. Right. Yeah. So I think that's the first thing we got to establish. I think there are some generational players out there and they, they all, they all probably in excess of 50% of all the gold in the world. And yeah. they, their, their, their wealth is not measured in dollars. They control the printing press. They're in yeah. fact, France is instructing the JP Morgans and Goldman Sachs to short the market printing papers. So, so that, that they can buy more. Yeah. Back, to back them on the refineries to accumulate. So I think just because there's X amount of silver above ground doesn't mean that it's going to come to the market. They're not spending. Yeah. So let's talk no. about available potential to be purchased for fiat to be okay. used in manufacturing. In well, the well, you know, talk about scrape silver and et cetera. I will give you, I'll give you a sort of an interesting point is uh, silver went up from $15 an ounce to $49 an ounce. I think it was back in 2012, 11. 13. Yeah. Yeah. And it was reportedly Eric Rod and a couple of Asian investors that were conjure up about, you know, few hundred million bucks and, and, and went to the market and want to buy 50 million ounces of silver. 50 million prices. And, and that triggered a run on silver. And that is, is a story that I heard. And they eventually, JP Morgan were caught naked and have to somewhat I think they they spewed about 100, 200 million ounces to calm the market down. So that is the here that is the story that I heard. Uh, I think that look, Francis, if somebody were to come up and and want to make a go at it for 100, 200 million ounces of silver, which is about four billion dollar, I think that in itself would drive easily silver to break out of thirty dollars. I don't think that there is 100, 200 million ounces of silver available uh, in the market. And then if you look at prices, how fragile the system is. As you know, like futures market right now, COMEX silver trading at probably 50,000 ounce contracts a day. That's 250 million ounces per day. That's changing hands. The, the, there is what a, a week of volume. That's more, that's more than the nominal uh, silver trading on the futures market for a week. That's more than the silver production, which is about a billion ounces. Uh, a billion ounces of silver physical is only $20 billion. We're not talking with a lot of uh, a lot of physicals out there, but no. I, in my view, I don't believe that there is 200, 100 mi I don't, I don't believe there's 200 million ounces and even a hundred million ounces of silver to be had. If somebody would just, just come with the money today and say, I want that silver. And fortunately for us, it's, it's not that simple. If, if a guy really want to come up with $4 billion, I want to buy two, uh, 400, 400, 200 million ounces of silver would be $4 billion. If some guy read a check for 5 billion cash, which, which is not insurmountable or inconceivable uh instead of getting silver physical showing at the door they're gonna get a call from the fbi <laughs> yeah. I, I, <laughs> yeah i agree with that i agree with that hey i don't think what, warren buffett is lost they'll get the hunt brothers it. treatment it, it'll they will almost be viewed as the hunt brothers and saying you're destabilizing the system you're a terrorist <laughs> you know yes. wanting to buy that amount of system you're going to be labeled a warren, terrorist. Warren buffett. i don't think warren buffett if you look at what warren buffett said about silver you know, Warren Buffett dislodged their silver, I think it's about 150, 100 million. I don't remember how much in the early 2000s. 
And Warren Buffett boss over never, Warren Buffett's a smart guy. He's, he never said he boss over because of inflation. He boss over because of whatever, right? It was mispriced. So Warren Buffett actually never mentioned about inflation. He also have always have a thin view on gold and silver saying that, you know, you cannot eat it. Well, you cannot eat US dollar either. Um, so I'm just saying that the people that know the market there, they are, it's not so easy to sort of accumulate, but they are in that stealthy accumulation phase. Because if you look at them, if you look at the uh, spread of silver physicals versus uh, silver price right now, the margin is as high as it's ever. Like to buy the American Eagle right now is, you know, it's going to cost you about $35, if not more, on the $25 uh, silver price right now. Usually, high margin spells for the froth or the peak of the market, but not in this instance. And so, for instance, I can clearly see that the 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 the, uh, the cartels are managing the silver market and throttling of the retail demand by 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 throttling the 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 uh, the uh, physical to the coin re uh, the mint. So that's why you are, and that's going to be continued the case. They're not going to ban people from owning gold and silver. They're just not going to give the the gold physical to the mint to mint their coins and bullion. Unfortunately, that's, that's why I said a lot of that gold and silver is going back into the cartels. You know, that's never going to see the light of day. And, and yeah. so therefore, I don't, I don't think the amount of physical above ground inventories is a material discussion, but nonetheless, okay. it's a I, good, it's I, a good point. I don't think it's there's, a, I don't think there's a million, I don't think there's 200 million ounces of silver to be had. Yeah. If somebody want to go at it, okay. it's not a bit. I, and, and the game is essentially for big buyers to buy consistently at that level that's just below the FBI telephone call level, um, where you are considered a, a regular and consistent big buyer, but not uh, someone who's disruptive to the market and therefore an economic terrorist to their fiat Ponzi scheme. Okay. So the stick, yeah. I will show one more word before I forget. Uh in the first time in 15, in 10 years, the last time I bought silver was 2015. I bought a batch, a few hundred, uh, maybe a couple thousand, probably maybe a thousand dollars at around uh, $17, uh, 2013. I started buying gold again. Uh, and uh, just uh, last month, I bought uh, 30 ounces, uh, $16,000, which is, which it must with that many, 30 coins. Um, the reason is this, prices. If you look at what happened to nickel, I highly recommend, guys. The LME, nickel doesn't trade on COMEX, it trades on LME, or CF, it doesn't trade on CME, it trades on LME. Yeah. And nickel went from 10 to $50 in March, within a week, in 2000, just a year ago. So I have, we have a nickel project in Manitoba, that's why I watch nickel very close. We're also very bull market on nickel. LME is under a multi-billion dollar lawsuit right now because they cancel, Francis, hear me out. They, can, they cancel billions of dollars of trades at nickel over fifty dollar, they reset the trades to thirty, which is the day the prior day closing. Nickel went about three hundred fifty in like two hours, and they canceled the trades. They 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 settled the trades at thirty, not fifty, at thirty. Okay, and then they they square everybody at thirty and they call it a day. And and why? Because the LME is owned by Hong Kong Stock Exchange, which is controlled by the Chinese government. And the biggest guy short is the Chinese tycoon with ties to the Chinese government. And so you replace the Chinese with JP Morgan. And 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 then you and then you you basically replace nickel by silver. And yeah. and prices, there you have it. It's silver. And, and they, they had the they had the narrative of bags of stones that they thought was inventory, weren't the bag the bags of rocks story. Traffic go rod, there there's now people who are discovering how tight the nickel market is. So I think the the takeaway here, Francis, is that silver could stage identical replay. Like you don't know how tight it is until it fucking excuse me, until it breaks out. And that magic marker is 30, Francis. So why silver goes to 30? Can it go to 50 in like two days? Entirely possible. When things get out, out of hand, it's just gonna go completely out of hand. And there's no recourse or there's no rem remedy. And the government's remedy would be they're going to halt CME. They're going to halt the futures market. They're going to halt the trading of, 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 of SAG on the ETF. They're going to reset the market at 30. And unfortunately, Francis, they're going to redeem your contract, your ETF at $30 an ounce. And then, and then they're going to hold the market like LNE. They hold this nickel trading for a week. And then... They they had all sorts of crazy things happen. 
right? Just hear me out. What they did is they allow certain players to roll their futures contract without settle. Okay, which is which is crazy. And then they they and then they you can you can then you can uh you cannot you cannot shore you cannot loan. There's all slew of new rules that come. Literally, literally the the nickel market the LME nickel is 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 done. The volume went down ninety percent from pre halt levels. And then you can get you scap up if there's a limit, there's down limit, up limit, there's margin. This and the margin is up to 70 percent. There's all sorts of stuff going on. So my point is, Francis, you need to get physical. The takeaway is you cannot buy synthetic. You have to buy physical. Because the day will come when they hold the CFD. And they will cheat. They will give you thirty dollars on fifty and you will short pocket at twenty. And there's absolutely nothing you can do. You're gonna see the silver market rip, and there's nothing you can do. And even when the when even when the CNE resume trading, it could it could print forty dollar, but the physical is gonna trade at seven. There's gonna be a disconnect, and uh, it's so that's why I advocate you gotta get the physical now. This 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 these times are different from the past. This is this is not this paper trading thing is gonna blow up, and nickel and that nickel trading is is shocking of the. In, in terms of the measures that they took to suppress the nickel market. It's, it's astounding. And, and it's just out of interest, corporations that need nickel are probably now doing bilateral direct trade agreements with mines because that volume's gone on the exchange. It's almost as if the exchange is no longer deemed a viable source for purchases. How are people getting nickel supply now if the, 90, if the volume has fallen 90% because this is a proven to be a scam? For instance, it shocks me. It really shocks me on how oblivious and how almost obtuse the industries are. <laughs> and let me explain that to you. Only, you see that's so obvious, right? Writing on the wall. However, only the only Elon Musk is doing exactly what you're saying. Elon Musk is going to ballet, which is the which is the one of the largest uh, uh, nickel producer in the world. And then and also went to Indonesia government, which is the largest nickel source in the world today, going directly after uh, nickel supply. Unfortunately, uh, right now the nickel market is sort of roughly balanced. It hasn't really tilled the balance in like the silver market, even though the writing is on the wall, because EV, even though EVs are selling like crazy, but but EV demand is going to continue to accelerate in the future, just like silver physical demand is going to accelerate in the future. Very naively, for instance, unfortunately, I talked to over seven out major auto manufacturers in the world. They're the top 10, okay? They're, they're so oblivious of what's happening. And, 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 and when they- Or are they just co-opted into the same cartel? You will support our exchange. Is, you will not go out of the, the, the circle we've drawn for you. Exactly. You know what they're doing? In response, in response, and this is coming from Ford or from GS. So I am not giving any sense. When, when interviewed as to whether they have enough nickel for their future vision of EV, which is going to quintuple, whatever it is, they say, no problem. You know, we, we've been assured by our battery suppliers that there's not going to be a problem. And then if you ask the battery suppliers, the battery suppliers, oh, we have been assured by the Glencores and by the Trifigoras that there will be ample supply. I mean, and then, and then the Tribigor and Glencore, what's happening now, they're discovering their, their, their feet has got bags of sands. And then it's, it's, it's hundreds of million dollar, multi, it's a $700 million fraud. Tribigora, they call, they've been defrauded upwards of 700 million. So I think everybody is still putting a pillow under the base. They're not seeing the inevitable that's happened. And I'm quite shocked that that given what's happening in 2022 with what happened to the nickel LME, that they're still not woken up yet. They're still, they're still like, you know, very nonchalant about, about what's But I get on. the impression that the CEOs of Toyota, Ford, et cetera, that are at the Bilderberg group will be saying, don't you worry your little head about that there problem. We all ha we have that sorted. And, and of course the Glen cause, which is very, deeply into the cartel as you'll know with all the stories etc they'll be saying yes don't you worry you know supply side leave that to us 
but we could in fact be we in loggerheads where it's not about chips for cars it'll soon be about base metals that won't even be available it will not be available it's going to be a head-on collision it's no question about that francis and, and I think, let me, let me sort of back roll a bit. Let me retract a bit. I mean, these auto manufacturers, they have a lot of moving parts, right? Put a car in place. You have what? Copper, nickel, and, uh, and, uh, tires and, uh, you know, seat belts and the airbags. So nickel used to be a small element of it. And that's, I, I just don't think that they haven't paid the attention to the potential head on collision, the imminent collision, but I think they're catching up quickly. And that's why they're approaching companies like us that has a pre-production stage project that's not going to come on stream with nickel for another five years and yet they're talking to us which means that they are they are starting their light bulb is starting to catch on but they are but they're they they need to go faster because i mean on, on the most conservative estimate by 2030 if ev is really going to have a 30 40 percent penetration you're going to need double the amount of nickel and right now the nickel supply is going down it's not going up why Exactly for what you said, right? ESG, permitting, local oppositions. Right. Uh, it's all of that. There's no new nickel coming out of the ground. So how is it going to balance out well? A lot of substitution needs to happen, just like silver in the panel. You're going to find more substitute for silver in industrial demand, just like they have to find substitute for nickel. in the, So, you know, your, 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 the price of your fork is own is not going to be as looking as pretty as before it used to be a lot more higher nickel content and, and now it's not even as shiny and maybe a little rusty <laughs> on your ut utensils and your piping might have some pro more pro than than nickel might not be ideal but you know that's just the way it has to go because right now around 70 80 percent of nickel goes into stainless steel so there is a bit of sub sub substitution effect that has to happen yeah so, but that's going to put pressure on other metals that are going to be the substitutes and they're going to run into the same situation in due course as well, because it's all metals are dug out of the ground at some point. You've got to return back to the same problem. It, you might buy a little bit of time with substitution. You might get quality drops, um, but it's going to end up happening. So if you were buying, if you weren't already heavily invested in silver elephant mining, um, what small caps that are yet to go production but are of great quality or even one or two that are broken ground and they are actually early doors production small cap silver miners so i say to my community i want to find you a 50x to 100x possibility a 20 million or a 50 million or a 100 million mine that's going to be 2 billion 5 billion 6 billion how, uh, which other names are people that you respect that you think they're onto a good thing and they, and they currently still not appreciated? Yeah, Francis, I, I want to go back to uh, the nickel, right? Just one minute. One thought I want to finish sure. is, as you and I would agree that the market fundamentals, it's, it's, the, 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 it's not the fundamentals, industrial demand that drive, it's not the fundamentals that drive the market. It's, it's not for housing market. It's not for... It's not for silver. It's not for nickel either. It's always the speculators, and that's so. What I'm saying is that even even with the strong fundamentals, you think the stocks didn't go. It's going to go places you probably never even imagined because you have not introduced the speculator element to it. And that's why Sprott Asset Management is creating a, a, a ETF for nickel. And I think you're going to have a lot of this physical ETFs going to come out stream and molybdenum, which is another minor metals, and you know that price just doubled. Molly price doubled just in the last three months. It's because all of a sudden that that uh, more people need Molly than ever before. No, is there some mind disruption? No, just like oil, right? You were talking about oil. You know, like, oil demand is always be seventy-five to eighty-five million barrels, but all of a sudden you draw or or add to that five million barrels of demand that could cause double or or half of the oil price. So it's always this like, element. That would dictate the, and I, like I said again, I think it's only getting started. You, you get in the smidges of, of action that could, that could take place, like, like Nicole and see Bali. And, and, and when Silver really got into it, my God, you know, right now it's very underpriced. Now, talk about Silver Junior market. I will focus on, um, I've been around for 25 years, and many people, even industry insiders, call it raw. I will focus, first of all, on, uh, uh, silver juniors with resources in the ground. I think that is something that you don't need to be specking out on exploration. 
And then secondly, you got to diversify a bit on geographics because you never know. Mexico used to be great and now they have a lot of problems. Bolivia used to be very problematic and now they're embracing investors with open arms. United States used to be the blueprint like the environment. Now they're in this, they're in this, this crossroads as to whether they want to go green or want to commission mine. Even in Canada, different jurisdictions and provinces, Manitoba is great, British Columbia is problematic. And even within the province, different geolocations, communities have different views on mining. Now, uh, my pick is silver elephant. I, I, like, I don't think dollar for dollar you cannot find a better deal. And uh, we have been purposely sort of throttled in, in our marketing promotion. That's why it's not, it's not anything wrong with the mine. We're just, we're just hunkering down. We're not doing as much promotion. But we're now embarking. But silver is broken now. So I'm very, I like the silver elephant a lot, 20 cents per ounce silver in the ground. You cannot beat that. But there's skills and I don't mind. For those watching, um, and so that you can get to plug this properly, I don't mind uh, that at all. And I'm sure people will recognize it's not advice. Uh, what is your uh, code on the chart? Sorry, uh, T Toronto Exchange You are, is your yeah, thing? on the Toronto main ward, uh, the symbol is E L E F. Elf. Yeah, okay, that's a good one. Okay, excellent. Makes sense. E L F, and it's on Toronto Financial Corp. E L F Financial Corp. EL Financial? No, no, EL, no. Yeah. That's on the trial. EF, yeah, that didn't sound right. Uh, ELEF. Uh, there we go. Silver and Elephant Mining. Brilliant. Um, let me just pull that up. Now, people should expect, obviously, a very low liquidity um, on a smaller cap equity. Um, I see it's been listed since 2007. Is that correct? Yes. So let me just bring that up and people can see that. And it's uh, getting unloved for now in an environment where the love should be uh, coming. <laughs> uh, so quite a bit of volume uh, since 18 to uh, 23, but before that, pretty uh, pretty thin. Um, and this is ELEF, Silver Ele Elephant Mining Corp. So market cap is just 20 million. At the moment, is that correct? Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, right now it's says uh, sixteen million. And prizes, we were we were most loved two years ago, and now we're the least loved. These things going pendulums. And uh, I mean, when you talk about liquidity, I, I think you and I agree. When the market is at the bottom, it's the least liquidity, and when the market is at the top, it's the most liquidity. And, yeah. you know, I remember when I was buying Colony Vancouver in Vancouver, Asia, in year 2000, when nobody wants. So why would you buy a Colony in Vancouver? There's nobody, there's no volley. You should buy something in Vegas. And that's year 2000. That was the top of Vegas. It was the bottom for, for, for Vancouver housing market. Uh, yeah. In the, you know, in, in 2020, in 2021, the company was trading uh, turnover every quarter. We were trading the entire flow. I mean, we're trading tens, we're trading... You know, it's three, four million shares a day. I mean, see the scale on the volume. So liquidity is not so much a concern. If we believe that the bull market is coming for silver, I would not be concerned about so much more liquidity because prices, we have the goods, we have the silvers in the ground. So we're not as speculative as some exploration stories that's based on one or two drill holes, right? Uh, we have the silver in the ground. Now, if you want to talk about, uh, so right, the, the market is, is uh, trending. Um, the company's well Would you up sell to, yep. to someone else to take to production? Is that an exit strategy you're considering, or is it your intention to go through the whole cycle and start a mine and go through that process? And do you have the skill sets and the, the people around to do that? So people are going to look for the points of failure, and they're going to see a technical chart that looks, you know, mainly down. I've got it on log scale at the moment, but if uh, you know on unlogged, it just looks like you know something that's they will think going to zero uh, inevitably, but it's not. Um, it's just an unloved industry at the moment, and you're an unloved example that's a little bit micro cap. What, where's the points of failure? Do you have any known bad news that is an issue or that's going to be more problematic for you uh, that you should disclose at this point? For example, you've got, you're going to expecting a higher uh, you know, cost of extraction because of X, Y, or Z, et etc. et cetera or anything known right well i think for instance our chart is not it's not uh very different from other <laughs> junior miners including first majestic the, yeah. the company just acquired the silver project in 2016. so if you look at only for our silver 
then you can, you got to really look at the price action starting from 2016. Uh, the company, the, the, the price broke down in 2022. There, oh, I first of all, let me say that there is no undisclosed material events uh, that that is sort of adversely affecting the stock. However, in 2022, there is a correction on the on the company, and part of that was that it was there was a spin-off, there was a corporate uh, transaction where the non-silver assets were spun out of silver and elephant, such as the nickel project I, I talked about. So some okay. people were in silver elephant for nickel, so they were they were buying and uh, silver elephant to get the nickel uh, dividend shares. So I think there were some attrition from silver elephant base, and that's why the, the share corrected uh, because once the nickel guys got their nickel shares and they know they wanted silver elephant. So there's a bit of a correction in that. And unfortunately also that, for instance, we call it in that Dow, Dow shaft, right? So like 2022 was was not friendly to the silver market. So I think from, it's a combination of the corporate event coupled couple with the driven down of the silver market. Uh, that 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 sort of precipitated to what you see. However, you can also see that the price is bottom since middle twenty twenty, since middle twenty twenty two. And uh, the nickel so components get a separate listing, and could people look at that if they were interested in nickel, or was it privately sold off and there's no participation? No, so if you look at the uh, the nickel symbol is Flynn F L Y N. The company's name is Fly Nickel. So F L Y N. Got you. So that that was then in that should have a two thousand and yes, I see the listing uh, also hit quite hard. Let's just go to a retail. <laughs> well, we came out with the bang had a hundred million dollar market cap. We traded ten million shares in March when we got listed. Um, there's your volume. So unfortunately, sometimes, for instance, um, that uh, people get caught up in the moment. Maybe the story is really got some legs to it, and we exhaust the buy. So, so at times, for instance, everybody came in, and then uh, and then they bought what they wanted, and then and then you know we had to, went through a harsh went through a harsh ride. However, you see, twenty twenty three, you know, when the when the metals market bottoms, you can see quite clear that this uh there's a there's a body and then breaking out of that down shaft. So we expect uh, we expect the uh, fly nickel to be a very good proxy to the nickel market going forward. Uh, this yeah. this project has a billion pounds of nickel in the ground, eighty five thousand meters of drilling, and uh, over forty million dollars of investment. Very similar theme to what you saw in Silver Elephant, because I mean, Francis in hard. But again, pre mine, pre pre mining, but proven reserves. Exactly. So Francis, I cherry pick these assets. I'm an investor. I'm a CFA. I'm like you. I am a. I, I'm looking for. I, I. I have a forecast on the metal, and I look for an asset that that which can get me that leverage, right? If yeah. if my scenario to play out, which it did, because we bought the so the elephant bought the nickel mine for fifteen million dollars in 2021, and then 2022 nickel went to fifty dollars, and we IP on a hundred million dollar market cap. Unfortunately, Francis, I'm a. I am a CEO of a company. I didn't sell a single share. In fact, I doubled my. Uh, I doubled my holding at 60 cents. Never in any imagined it would go to 10 or 13. And uh, so I, I'm not as nimble as you are, Francis, in my risk control. Uh, but you know, well, I, I, I don't know if I would have done much different. I think people are going to feel more encouraged to hear that you are still skin in the game and, in fact, advanced, uh, added to your skin in the game rather than just uh, we're exit strategy on the IPO. Um, I've had enough of investor banks that do super flaky, super high valuations and sell on the hype and are actually greatly reduced in the subsequent slump. So I think you, you, you're winning on the integrity stakes if you're not winning on the financial stakes just yet. And the long game is the long game. Well, uh, Francis, I think just uh, 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 nickel in terms of leverage, right now nickel valuation is very similar to silver at around $16 million market cap. At a billion pounds of of nickel in the ground, you are paying sixteen cents per pound of nickel, and nickel right now is trading at ten dollars. So that is the that is the optionality that you're talking about. You you're paying sixteen cents for 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 a pound of nickel that's trading at uh 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 that's trading at ten dollars. However, you know 
nickel is ten dollars a pound it's not thirty dollars an ounce it's gonna cost you more money to get it out of the ground so that is an optionality aspect now friends i do want to address on the exit strategy um i have been around for 13 years and i've got you know during my lifetime i've known quite a bit of industry insiders we are built we're assembly a world-class management team so we have specialists uh that's that's uh that understand environmental and permitting you know, 30 year veteran, and that actually represented uh, governments and First Nations in permitting matters. And we also have a chief operating officer that is uh, a, a, a lifelong miner with Valley Inco, 30 year mining, you know, started with a foreman running a mine, become a general manager. So we are recruiting the pieces together that if the market is uh, conducive to, to, uh, to, uh, for, for, for uh, uh, debt equity financing to build a mine. Then, then, you know, we we, we keep the option open. Uh, more important to the question, Francis, is about the timing of, of exit. I think that's actually more important as a trader, like you are. So I think often CEOs make a mistake. It's, you know, somebody paid 30% premium for my money, so so I have to fulfill my fiduciary duty and sell, right? But you should be looking at not 30% premium to your share price, but you should be looking at the underlying metal, whether it's, that metal is 20% of the bottom or has 20% on the top. I think that is a lot more important that the investor understand the, yeah. that the CEO understand the macro view of the, of yeah. the, of, of, of the metal under that up, uh, metal. So from where I understand and it could stick and my view could differ, but we're not going to, we're not looking to sort of exit nickel, uh, or, you know, divest our asset probably until nickel is 30 to, 30 to $40, which is three to four times from where we are. And for silver, yeah, you know, we're gonna make a look at a run of the silver and out of depending on interest rate, where the dollar is, or if the dollar still exists. But I would I would say at the very minimum, if gold has three thousand, like you said, there's no reason not for silver to be at fifty. So so I, I don't see any corporate event until silver is at least fifty dollars. And then at that time, we prepared our data room. We're gonna invite all the strategics and and the banks and looking at all the options. And we're making sure that project is de fully de risk at that point so that the project could be shovel ready, that there are no impediments for its production at that time. Yeah. So get it oven ready, as you say, uh, in the meantime. John Lee, uh, silver elephant mining, and of course, also in the nickel business, we've just taken a look. It's been an absolute pleasure. We've spoken for a long time. We might have to split this into two parts. Uh, if people want to find your website uh, or to know more about uh, you or contact you, where, where do they do that? Yeah, so the uh, the company's website is silverelef.com. If you just Google silver elephant and mining, or if you're interested in nickel, which is the metals of the future, then that will be uh, flynickel.com, F-L-Y nickel.com. Gun to your head, uh, the, bigger, the bigger turn in percentage valuation, silver or nickel? And I and I'm Whoa. taking one of your minds yeah. away from you. You gotta you gotta keep just one. Which one is which is the hold? You know, I got about a million dollar on both on each. Uh, my my equity holding is almost identical for each one of them for both. They're both my babies, the Sophia's choice. If I have to venture and say in the short term, I like silver more. Uh, in the next six to twelve months. But I I think that both both are they they do have dynamics are different like for example silver you know you're dealing with the cartels you're dealing with the fundamentals of the money nickel doesn't have that problem with with, with you know somebody who's managing the nickel market but nickel has a different set of dynamics in terms of laterite production there's a lot of resources in indonesia but it's a very dirty process and then also you could the, the market could find a substitute for nickel given how quickly technology is advancing so Every market has a different pros and cons. I, I see both market at least double from where we are. Metals, like nickel easily 20 to 30. Silver, I think the long side nickel might have a better upside in silver, but silver has been more torque in the very near in the very near term uh, because of the geopolitics that we're seeing the central bank diversification. So I, I, I think silver can easily go 30 to 50, but nickel probably uh, fifteen to twenty dollar for this year. Right now, nickel is at around ten. I think fifteen is probably more realistic for nickel this year. But silver fifty is a very distinct possibility. Awesome! Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your wisdoms. It's been really enjoyable, and uh, we we must do a check in again uh, in a year's time or even six months if you've got anything new to tell us. You know, Francis, it's such a pleasure. I wish I had known you earlier. I definitely check out your your uh, your YouTube. You have three years of his of. Uh, 
and I see you have a lot of good track records and uh, I mean, certainly, you know, I'll be very interested in, in studying your thoughts further as well. Yeah, that's great. That's very kind. Uh, we've had Rick Rule on, for example, uh, through someone I'm sure you'll know who was big on the uranium. We've had some interesting guests. We're looking for more, much like your good self. Have a great day and thank you very much, uh, John Lee. Have a great day. Thank you.